Awesome. So it looks like we've got a pretty decent turnout today. Um, just want to say hi to everyone. Um, and of course, for the uni students, feel free to put where you are based, what you're studying and what uni you're at. Um, that way we can we can connect a little bit through there. But we'll just start off with an acknowledgement of country. So before we begin, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and their continuing connection to our community. We pay respect to them, their culture and to their elders past and present. As many of us are watching in locations all around Australia and New Zealand, I would like to pay our respects to the traditional owners of the country on which we all live and work. I would also like to recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and community and pay our respects to them and their culture and to elders both past, present and future. Awesome. So today we've got quite the lineup of speakers. We've got Sunil later on um, and he'll be talking about the Founders Hub. Um, yeah, Sunil can give us a wave. Um, there we go. Talking about the Founders Hub, but then we'll have Lucy and Alexander Kran before, um, and they'll be talking about their respective startups. DP and I were actually having a look at the startups before, and they're pretty exciting, pretty cool. Um, so we're quite excited for those presentations. Um, we might kick it off with Alexander first, if that's all right. Cool. All yours. Right. Oh, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Alexander. Um, I am the CTO at Climate Clever. Uh, I am a software engineer. Um, so, uh, so I guess, you know, since uh, you're all students studying at uni, I thought I'd just share a little bit of my background first. Um, I didn't mean to be a software engineer. It happened by accident. Uh, I wanted to be a musician when I was a teenager and sort of got convinced by my mom that I would be a bum for the rest of my life if I was a, a musician I'd got forced into engineering uh, so I went and did like audio and uh, audio and electronics at university um, which I don't use I don't use my degree but I fell in love with programming while I was there on the side um, and yeah I worked in big business back home in the UK when I moved to Australia I started working with startups because they're much more fun to work with you get to try ideas out really fast um, and then I ended up working for Climate Clever uh, with our CEO, Vanessa Rowland. And um, at Climate Clever, we, uh, we help businesses, schools and homes uh, monitor and reduce their carbon footprint uh, with a big focus on schools and businesses, uh, because that's where we can make real, real big impact. Um, and we are an API first platform, which is a little, uh, which I'll explain a little bit in a, in a minute. Um, but we also have some uh, really cool uh, web apps and stuff that we've built uh, just to help people monitor and reduce their emissions, which is which is a really, really hard thing to do um, because it takes time and effort. And obviously we live in a fast paced world, um, so we try our best to make it as easy as possible, um, but obviously it has its challenges. Um, so I'll just see if I can share my screen and I'll show you a few things from the website and our, our web app and and maybe show you what our new reports look like and and I'll show you a little bit about what I get up to on a day to day basis as well. Uh, and then if you know you have any questions, feel free to buy them at me um, and I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, OK, cool. Let's uh, let's give this a whirl. Uh, so I think I can just share the whole window. The desktop, there we go. OK, can you see my screen or are you looking at my desktop? Um, can see your screen. So you can see the Climate Clever Carbon report? Yep. Cool. cool. Uh, it always it always get a bit some of the, you know, team meeting things don't share your screen when you slide off to the side. Um, so, yeah, so our main focus um, is that we help businesses and schools produce this wonderful, lovely report. Um, it's all generated on our servers that we're moving onto Azure at the moment. And this sort of like gives breakdowns of uh, your emission streams, what you're doing to reduce them uh, and all that stuff. And it's a really transparent report, which is something that kind of doesn't really exist in our industry um, and just basically allows you to produce uh, sort of a, a status saying, hey, look, you know, this is my business for 2020 or this is my school for 2020. This is our total footprint. This is what we've done and this is where we're going um, and this this has been a big job 
and it, it looks kind of nice and pretty, but it's actually been a really big job. It's taken like a few years to get to this point where we can produce this wonderful report for people, um, which sounds crazy uh, because it's just a PDF, but there's a lot going on under the hood. Uh, and I'll show you a bit more about that. Now, I myself, I don't really build much of the front end. I am not, not good with making things look pretty. Uh, so I mostly deal with the servers. Um, so, you know, big thanks to the rest of my team for making this look so wonderful. Um, and yeah, so we do this through uh, our online platform, uh, which exists as web apps. Um, so, you know, if you go to our website, climateclever.org, you can find an app for business schools and homes. Uh, at the moment, it's an online app and it kind of looks a little bit like this. So uh, you log in and we give you your status um, and it's kind of split up into modules. So measure is where we measure your emission streams. Um, so, you know, electricity bills, gas bills, water bills, waste bills, car travel, air travel, paper. Uh, we've got a few more emission streams coming over the next few months. Uh, like IT equipment, which is a huge emission stream for a lot of companies. Uh, and basically we have a few different ways of you entering bills, everything from like manual entry to uploading CSVs uh, to a few smart uh, things we do where we log into your utility provider and scrape out all your bills for you. Um, then the next step obviously is to plan actions to reduce your footprint. Um, and then obviously you can break it down and track and sort of get a really good look inside what's going on. Uh, we had some really interesting stories when we did this with schools. Uh, when we first brought out the platform, it was just Google Docs and uh, Excel sheets because uh, we were just trying out the idea. So, you know, you don't need to build a full fledged app to see if something works because we ran the entire platform on Google Docs and Excel sheets for an entire year with like 15 schools. Um, and it was really interesting watching them all compare data and share the Excel sheets between each other because one school was like, why are my gas bills so high? And it turned out they had like seven gas leaks. And the only reason they figured that out was because they had other schools to compare the data to. So it really shows you the power of like collecting and comparing data can be. Um, yeah, and then sort of we move on to offsets where, you know, whatever footprint uh, that you can't reduce through actions, you know, you can offset using carbon credits. Um, and then we move on to our nice reports, which I just showed you. Um, and that's that's kind of the app in a nutshell. Um, yeah, um, and I'll also I'll just jump into a little bit about the journey of the startup and then I'll sort of give you an overview of what I do on a on a day to day basis, which isn't as fun. Um, I just need to stop sharing my screen. There we go. Um, yeah, so uh, we started off, like I said, with uh, Google and Excel sheets, but the founding of the company was way before that. Um, so Vanessa Rowland, our CEO, um, founded sort of the idea for the company all the way back in 2012, when as part of her PhD uh, research, she certified the first carbon neutral school in Australia. So she came in uh, to South Fremantle High School. I think it's called something else now because it joined two schools together. And, you know, they, they helped that school go carbon neutral uh, by one, measuring all its emissions, uh, two, helping them do just behavior changes. I know it's going to sound really crazy, but like 50 to 60% of the actions that we suggest to people to do are just behavior changes. And, you know, through behavior changes, for example, we saved a school like five grand in three months, which is just insane, right? So just the way that we behave and live can actually massively affect our footprint. And we don't even think about it because we never really have. Um, so she sort of certified that first carbon neutral school and it really stuck with her how easy it was to one, help the school save money, which is really great because the school can use that money for other things and two, have a lower carbon footprint. And obviously she kept trying to build an app, um, but building apps cost lots of money, um, unless you can code it yourself, I guess. Um, and yeah, eventually she came to a dev agency I worked for and uh, we built her the first version and I left the dev agency and then came work for Climate Clever full time. And it's gone from Google Docs and Excel sheets to a platform for schools. And then we branched into homes during COVID. Uh, and then during COVID, we also moved into businesses and schools and businesses have become our main focus. One, because they're where we can have the biggest impact, like they have the biggest impact on their community. Uh, and, and two, also, you know, it's it's 
they have money where they can pay for things. <laughs> it's, it's a little harder to survive just on homes as a business as well. So there's also that commercial aspect to it. Like businesses need to start proving to the, their consumers that they're taking action, that they are reducing in a transparent way. Um, and yeah, you don't need blockchain for it. You can do it without that as well. I know people keep telling me I need blockchain, but it's very easy to be transparent without blockchain too. Um, yeah, so um, I'll just quickly share you what I do. Um, it's not as fun as all the pretty stuff, but I just thought I'd give you a little a tour um, of that too. So I'll just quickly share my screen again. Um, yeah, so I spend all my time uh, building the servers. So we're an API platform. So that means uh, we have like a computer language interface, I guess, for those of you who don't know what an API is, it's like computers talking to computers. Um, and we build that first and then we build that the web apps on top of that. And the reason we do that is we have bigger businesses that use our API and integrate our services into, into them. Um, so that means I spend all my time uh, building servers, um, writing code, uh, stuff like that and sort of just creating things for like storing data, calculating data. Uh, for example, I'll give you, uh, this probably all looks like gobbledygook, but like, you know, this is the function that calculates electricity carbon based on your electricity bills. Electricity is incredibly hard to calculate because it's different based on state and all this other stuff. Um, so when I'm not coding and testing these sorts of things, I spend a lot of my time uh, building these things, which is API docs, not only for my front end team to use because I can't, you know, survive with them asking me questions every five minutes about how the API worked for them to build on it, um, but also because we have customers that use our API. So I'm actually terrible at writing and I hate writing, but I actually have to spend a big majority of my job building these API docs for our, de um, our developers to use and other developers to use. Um, because communication is a really big part of my of my job, um, even though I'm a developer, because you know I have to communicate my ideas to other people. So I spend a lot of time building API docs as well as servers. Um, and yeah, I guess in a nutshell, that's Climate Clever. That's what I do. And that's a little bit of our journey. Does anybody have any questions? Alex, maybe you could talk more about the, the values of Climate Clever and, you know, what makes it different from working from for a big corporation. OK, yeah, sure. Um, so I actually started uh, working in big corporations. That's where I first did my first programming. Um, and that's actually why I got really frustrated with big corporations, because I built a lot of stuff that never saw the light of day um, because things move a little slower in bigger companies because there's lots of management levels and things. So I, I sort of found that frustrating. So it's hard to create change both internally and externally sometimes at big companies. Um, but the nice thing about working at startups was that you get to move fast. If you have an idea, you can try it um, and you can have real impact. So we're actually a profit for purpose. Um, so it, we're not a not for profit, but you know we still believe in making a profit. But it means one, we give a percentage of our profits away, and two, it also means that we have like core values embedded in the business. Um, you know, everything from like dealing with sexism uh, to racial inequality to environmental issues. All this is built into our business model and our system. So it means that one, our employees are much happier. Um, so we have quite a low churn rate for a tech company because churn is normally quite high. So I'm quite proud of that. Um, it also means that we have a very diverse uh, workforce. Um, so we also have a lot of women here at Climate Clever as well, uh, which we're really proud of, especially in a very male dominated field like tech. Um, and, and that sort of involves and instills our business practices and how we conduct business and who we conduct business with. Uh, for example, um, you know, I'm not going to mention names, but we've had offers from certain very big oil and gas companies uh, um, that we have turned money down from because obviously, you know, I know we need oil and gas right now, but we need to transition away. And, you know, if they don't have a good transition plan, then they don't fall in terms of our alignment because we need that sort of stuff uh, for a better future. So those things kind of uh, incorporate into our business model as well. And um, 
<laughs> so how do you recruit those people that come into your company? Are you just advertising on the internet or are you handpicking people? So, so we don't uh, we don't use recruiters when we advertise. We normally go out through networks. So when we're looking for people, uh, we go out through LinkedIn, which is a big thing. Uh, if you're interested in software engineering and you're not on LinkedIn, get on LinkedIn, put up a profile, link your GitHub, and just you know build stuff and put it on there. It doesn't matter if it's perfect. The fact that you can build is really important. Uh, we also reach out to social groups. Um, in the two cities so we're in sydney and perth so lots of coding groups we always post in there um i'm actively involved in she codes in perth as well and i've recruited a few people from there too um so yeah we never normally advertise it's more sort of just going through our networks um, because when we advertise we just tend to get flooded with applications that don't I, it's hard to say but just it just don't have heart in them so we try and go to the sources uh, mostly for our for our jobs. So you'd encourage all the students here to be getting involved in local user groups, going to meetups, going to yes, one hundred percent events like that. Yeah, because the thing is, if you don't if you don't get involved in the community, you can be quite siloed in your thinking. Um, you know, like it, I mean, I'm a self taught engineer, um, which I love. Um, but the thing is, you know, a big part that's made me a good engineer is being exposed to lots of people, you know, um, so that's really important. I think there's a hand up. I can see a hand. Hi, Alex, I had a question for you, mate. Um, you know, for all the students on the line, it, are there specific technologies or capabilities or steps you would encourage? them to take if they want to pursue a career in engineering and more importantly not necessarily a career in engineering at a large organization but at a really fast moving exciting startup like yours or, or not even just you know areas to pursue but self-development areas as well okay yeah yeah so there's a few things i would always recommend um first uh, there's a lot of good online courses as well as uni degrees so i'd highly recommend doing one of those you know there's there's quite a few um, I used to use Team Treehouse when I started way back moving into iOS development like eight years ago. I don't know what the currently good ones are. I know Level Up Tutorials is quite good and Front End Masters have some good courses. You know, just do a few courses here and there uh, to pick up your skills. I'd recommend uh, having a look at uh, JavaScript, Python and Go. Um, those are two, sorry, three good languages to get a, gri a, gris a grip on. Um, React is also a good uh, sort of front end framework to have a look at as well. I recommend just sort of dipping your toes in. I mean, the way we do interviews is quite progressive as well. I tend to find so when we interview for junior positions, we don't give you big, long, complicated technical interviews. Um, we just get you to come in and tell you about yourself, you know, what you're sort of working on in your spare time, what you've been, you know, what you like, what you enjoy. We do ask you a few technical questions, but it's more very easy stuff you know when you're a junior we're sort of you know we, that's what the probation period for it's all about self-learning so we look for self-learning more than anything else it's like what have you been learning because you know development is very much continuous learning all the time so we want to see that you can do that that's what we kind of look for in our junior position so i would 100 recommend going online and doing some courses um i just finished a course on svelte kit on level up tutorials because we're moving our entire front end to Svelte uh, from React. So, you know, that that's, you know, I'm still learning and I've been coding more than 10 years. So I definitely, definitely learn some stuff. If you're interested in starting your own startup, which obviously has other skills besides coding. Um, so obviously I am a co-founder, so I do do stuff outside of coding as well. I do have a little hand in marketing and analytics and finance a bit. It's always good to pick up a few other skills. Um, definitely, you know, there's a bit of crossover in marketing and finance with development that I think are kind of important to pick up. Um, however, I will say you're not going to know everything, um, and that's okay too. Um, and that's why it's always good to have a co-founder. I know there are solo founders out there, but it's always good to found something in a team uh, because you know multiple people bring stuff together, and also it's good to have people to bounce stuff off. Um, so I'd 
also recommend, you know, if you've got an idea and you want to try it, see if you can convince someone else to come on the journey with you because, you know, those ups and downs that you go through as a startup is definitely better when you have someone else to do it with. Yeah, I definitely uh, don't build stuff alone. I think either, like, George <laughs> often helps me build stuff or Gia helps me build stuff. And um, it's it's much less frustrating. Oh, Joseph has often helped me with stuff because when I code and I get stuck, I can never see a way out of it. But when you've got someone to bounce ideas off, then everything goes a lot easier. And well, George and, jo and Joseph, in fact, all of them see things completely differently than me when we're building stuff. So they they really allow us to go in different directions than than my mind would have ever thought of. Mm, that's that's so true i feel like um software and coding is like you part of you has to become comfortable uh what was it like learning in public you know um so I, I i do a lot of that as well like i learn in public like i'll go oh you know i'm really interested how that works and i'll go you know write a blog post on it or record a video and share that with people at you know me learning it and making mistakes but putting it out there because hey look you know i just picked up dino and i i did this and this is you know there's a blog post see what happens right and you know if you've made a mistake someone on the internet will tell you <laughs> um yeah there's, there's a there's a there's a famous like sort of uh joke that goes around um from an engineer saying you know when they were stuck on something they used to go on reddit and ask a question and then open up another account and reply to it incorrectly because that would 100% guarantee that loads of people would comment and reply with it <laughs> so. That is a great hack. Yeah. <laughs> I've uh, also seen that on the unethical life pro tips for uh, how to get your um, answers for your university assignments. So please don't. <laughs> 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 might try that out then george for one of my uni subjects <laughs> um that's actually really good so thanks for that alex i think we've all learned a lot about climate clever um and that question you said as well about if you're interested in starting a startup well maybe sunil can answer that in the next section right so thanks again alex and i think we'll jump to sunil now if he can um, Jason, were you going to uh, drive the slides, mate, or? Up to you. I'm happy to draw it if you want I'm, to. I'm happy to do it, mate. I've just yep. got a lot of things in my background. <laughs> the magic so light appearing behind you every now and again. I like Oh, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's when the, uh, the, the scene thing gets a bit crazy, the background. Oh, do you know what we should also mention while Sunil's bringing that up is that Alex and uh, Vanessa appeared on uh, Microsoft Build and um, talking about how they're moving their their startup to Azure uh, and, um, you know, Founders Hub and stuff like that. So maybe I will find the link for that and post that in the chat so you can see Alex talking, Alex and Vanessa talking at Build about about Climate Clever if you need more. <laughs> well, I, I did have a quick look and I believe Alex and Climate Clever are definitely on Founders Up, which is very exciting. I, I couldn't find Space Champ, but uh, but they might be in the process of moving across. No, no, uh, uh, no, Space Draft are not Space at Draft. all there yet. We, uh, but we have, you know, started talking to them. They're inspired by the fact that Alex has moved and they're like, if all the cool kids are moving, awesome. Awesome. maybe we should. <laughs> Uh, well, we, we moved because the documentation, the, one of the biggest reasons was one, Azure is one of the most sustainable clouds uh, and also provide life cycle analysis for their servers, which is not what everyone else does. But two, uh, the documentation for serverless functions was so good that I didn't need anyone's help to use them. So <laughs> it's like, that's a win. Fine, we'll find whoever wrote that, Alex, and pass that on. I'll be very happy to hear that, mate. Engineers love a good doc. <laughs> uh, so, hey team, my name is Sunil Mishra. I am the Azure Business Group Lead 
for startups and SaaS partners. And a big part of my role is to talk to awesome startup companies like Climate Clever um, and help them, you know, in their journey, um, especially all the way from early stage startups to ones that have already found product market fit and have got a number of customers and ones that are scaling. And the way that we really try and do that is through what we call the uh, the Founders Hub program. Um, this is a program that we released uh, about four or five months ago now, uh, in March this year. And really it's aimed at, uh, at founders and helping give them uh, the tools and software capabilities and tools that they need to build the right product and then give them access to the right people within Microsoft that can help them build the right product and market it the right way. And then lastly, over time, give them access to third party tools and services, at, you know, free or discounted pricing, um, and then also access to external capital, um, which Alex will definitely become important, I think, in the next 12 months um, as we as we enter into the world that we enter into. Um, so to give you a little bit more depth on what I just said, um, you know, this is an online platform that's available and what we're really trying to do is build a community here. Um, and, you know, the best thing about this community is that it gives people a lot of free stuff. People always like free stuff and I found startups definitely like free stuff and I'm sure students like free stuff as well. Um, so some of the free stuff that you actually get as part of Founders Hub is, uh, is up to $150,000 in Azure credits. Um, Azure is our cloud platform, obviously. $150,000 in cloud credits can actually go a long way to alleviating some of the expenses for startups, especially if you're in the early stage of your life when you're just trying to, you know, you've got an idea and you want to test that idea and build that out instead of incurring these large cloud costs, which, uh, you know, can be thousands of dollars a month, depending on what you're building and testing, you get access to those free credits and that essentially gives you access to those products and services for free. Uh, but, you know, Microsoft is more than just cloud, as as I'm sure some of you will know. You know, we have Microsoft 365. Um, yeah, we have .NET capabilities. We have we also own LinkedIn. And the other thing is, we've actually bought GitHub as well. So when you join Founders Hub, you actually get access to a lot of the tools and services that allow you to build your products on top of Azure, and then also run your business productivity, etc. And that's another about another two hundred thousand dollars worth of benefits um, that you would otherwise, if you were purchasing these things directly, you would have to pay for. So all up, it's about $350,000 worth of benefits for early stage startups that join the program across Azure and across all of our other software and productivity suites as well. And then as I said, you know, one of the other great things about it is actually that it gives you a, it gives you access to a number of our trusted partners and we're building this out that provide you with free services and access, things like OpenAI, which is, uh, you know, one of, provides one of the world's best programmable language APIs, um, gives you access to that for free. Um, Answerata, which helps startups with fundraising and providing their data room capabilities, et cetera. And, uh, and Bubble, oh, Michelle, remind me what Bubble is. It's actually, um, I think it's, a, it's an orchestration software um, that, that you can utilize for free as well. And all of these are services that you would otherwise have to pay for, but if you're part of the program, uh, you would actually get that service for free. Now, whilst the free stuff is cool, what I actually think really um, adds value to people like yourself when you're building that startup is actually access to the technical advisors and mentors within Microsoft. So the technical advisors uh, is, you know, one-to-one -one technical advisory session that actually helps you look at your tech stack, what you're building out, um, and gives you advice on the right way to do it, build it in an optimal manner so it's cost effective, allows you to scale up and down as you grow um, and are testing things as well. And then the, the third thing down the bottom is mentors. The Microsoft Mentor Network gives you access to more people than just technical capability. It does do that as well. So if you want to go deeper into something, gives you access to, to cloud solution architects that can help you further, but it also gives you access to go-to-market specialists, fundraising specialists, um, you know, people like myself who was ex-venture capitalist, that if you're looking to raise money, I know how they think and how to pitch to them um, to really help you understand more holistically, hey, what I'm building is the right thing, but then how do I then go find customers to actually utilize my services? What's the most cost-effective way to do it? How do I go raise external funding? What are the tips and tricks that I need to understand um, through that as well? 
And then the third point is, you know, access to events and training. That's how we sort of build out this community of founders within Founders Hub, where you are joined, you know, where you are going to regular events with each other, learning from each other. And Alex, I'm sure you will um, attest to this. Founding a company and founding a startup is a lonely journey. Um, if you can find people that are going through that journey, you will learn so much more from each other and help you be much more successful. And that's why those events and those training sessions are, are a key part of this as well. Um, look, to join the Founders Hub program, there are a couple of uh, guidelines and selection criteria. Uh, you must, it, it, it has to be more than an idea. You have to have incorporated your, your business and actually have a LinkedIn profile for your business um, and be actually building a, typically a software-based product or service that you own and are building and developing yourself. Typically, we're looking at pre-seed to seed. That's really the sweet spot, but we will take up Series C if you've raised funding up to, to that level. Third point, look, you've really got to be in it for a profit uh, basis with typically education institutions, government entities, et cetera. They're not the right. You, you know, it's really you're building software, you're building a solution, you're building SaaS capability to go out and change the world and change the market. Uh, and then lastly, not enrolled in the uh, in the Microsoft for Startups program previously because we like giving away free stuff, just not multiple times to the same company. <laughs> So I will pause there. I know I've gone through, actually, no, there is one more slide. Now, some of you may be thinking, hey, I'm a student. I haven't really got an idea yet. How do I actually get to a point where I can access or join something like a Founders Hub? And Jason was kind enough to put this slide together. So I'm going to throw to you, Jason, to sort of talk through some of these programs that we partner with and offer that will help you as students build up your capability, build up your skills, and then get to a point where like, hey, Founding a business really sounds like an exciting idea. We've cracked onto the right thing. How do we do it? And how can Microsoft help? So, Jason, do we walk through this slide, mate? Yeah, perfect. So, Sunil summarized it perfectly, I think. Um, these are some of the things that Microsoft run that can help you on that journey and develop some of those technical or even softer skills that might be important in developing a startup, right? So, um, we've some of these events have already occurred this year. So if we look at Protégé and Imagine Cup, they've already happened in 2022, um, but they're both case competitions. So Protégé is one that's held in Australia and Imagine Cup is one that's actually a global event. Um, they're both really good opportunities for you to, I guess, practice problem solving, look into ways that software can innovate and help transform the way that we do things and apply them onto real case competitions. Some of the things that we have running uh, right now so codex is, is right now and i believe we're still taking applications for that um that's something where um it's for female identifying people um and they can apply for this program and essentially you learn to code you learn some of the microsoft technical solutions that you can apply um and this is a three-day boot camp to, to work on those technical skills and then we also have student summit um, which is coming up i believe in september um, if I'm correct there, Michelle. Um, she said September. I would just, just say CODES is not entirely technical skills. There is also, like like we have, core core career skills as well uh, in there. Um, yep. Oh, and Imagine Cup, although, you know, that's this year, towards the end of this year, they'll open for next year. So if you are learning to build something now and forming your teams like uh, Alex recommended at the start, then uh, you will have a team to enter as registrations open towards the end of this year for, for next year's cup. Yeah, and Imagine Cup is, is quite amazing. I think if, even if you just click on that link, um, you'll see that some of the prizes are quite, quite remarkable. So it's definitely worth giving a crack. Um, I'm happy to go into Q&A now um, for Sunil um, and then we can talk about some of these things. I think, <laughs> Sunil, one of the things that um, that I was talking about with Lucy was uh, I said to her, you know, maybe you could talk about why you'd recommend 
students might want to work at a startup or found a startup compared to working at a big company. And I know Alex has definitely answered on the pro there, but Lucy, <laughs> Lucy le leapt to the con straight away and she said, definitely do not do it. Do not do it. You have to be crazy to found a startup. You need, <laughs> you need to, you know, you need to be prepared to throw your life, your soul, your heart, your money, uh, into it and you might not you know you might end up you know really stressed from not earning money for for ages trying to pay the people that are working for you running around speaking to investors uh do, do you have any thoughts on <laughs> yeah look I, I'm more than happy to give you both the pros and the cons here guys um you know I've worked at large corporates my whole life but I've spent the last 10 to 15 years working very very closely with startups and startup founders so I I understand that journey quite well. Um, look, pros first of, of getting into a startup and working at a startup. You are going to do incredibly interesting stuff. Um, now, look, I'm going to be honest, don't believe the hype when you read it. All the startups uh, talk about, oh, we're changing the world. They're not. Like, climate clever? Maybe. But most of them, they're not. But you are working on really, really interesting products and services that you are going to build from scratch and see changing the way your customers work and they operate. And you will get that feedback loop incredibly quickly. Um, you will be able to go from an idea to a prototype to a product in market within a matter of months at times or at the most maybe a year or two. And look, to be fair, you kind of have to because that point Michelle made about the money business. Now, you know, you are, uh, and, and this is sort of some of the cons of working at a startup now, getting a little bit into it is, um, you know, it's hard. Too often we just see the survivor bias, which is all we glorify the successes. Um, you know, there's a number of statistics out there that say that roughly 90% of startups that start will fall. Um, and that is because it is a hard game to play um, and you have got to be incredibly capable at what you do and it's more important than just building the right product and the right solution that is awesome actually you've got to be able to figure out how to get in customers hands how to market to them and then more importantly how to get repeat customers get your pricing models right and all of that stuff so it is it is um it is definitely a hard game there is a lot to be said um i think for the way alex's journey has gone which is Potentially, once you graduate and come out of uni, go learn at a large corporate within an engineering role, if that's sort of what you want to do, because some of them are great training grounds to skill you up into understanding how the corporate world works, um, you know, what are sort of some of the things that it values, and then potentially finding, you know, something that is a problem that is not just a problem for your organization, but across multiple organizations and saying, hey, now that I've got a bit of an idea of how to operate, and, and work within a business, I can now go and take this idea and I want to make the leap and um, and actually go and found a startup. Stop there, Michelle. <laughs> Alex, did you have a question or a comment? You're on mute, mate. Is there something I could just add to the end of that as well? Um, I, I will say as a founder, there are incredibly hard moments um, and, you know, and, and it does get tough. Um, but it also doesn't mean that we can't push back on the status quo as well. Uh, like a lot of investors, um, you know, they expect you as founders to not be paid anything and work crazy hours. Um, but I treat, I mean, I do work hard, but I treat my, oh wait, I've lost you. I treat my staff and myself the way I want to be treated with good hours, flexibility, and I pay myself and so does Vanessa because, you know, we have to live. Um, and I think the more of us that push back on those crazy expectations pushed by some investors, the better. And the final thing that I will add is while we have raised investment, our sort of main goal is to be cash flow positive rather than just keep growing and raising, you know, because you know what's better than a, you know, a, a billion dollar startup is a startup that pulls in 25, 40 mil a year, you know, hires 30, 40 people, pays them all good wages and has a positive impact on the world around it. You know, we don't all need to be billion dollar companies that are chasing inevitable growth either. 
you know, I think that's also something to consider as well. So you don't need to keep raising forever either. So that's uh, that's another sort of counterpoint too. Uh, we don't all need to be worth billions of dollars, you know. I would uh, I would actually say, Alex, that is a really, really good point, because again, all we tend to glorify these huge companies that get large and, and you know, that's really, really exciting when you do get there. Um, but there is a a real pushback, I think, against that growth at all costs mentality. Um, and a lot of people are realizing you can build great businesses without some of the real downsides that come from uh, accepting external capital and all the pressures that come from that as well. Yeah, well, you've definitely gathered some external capital, hey, Alex. <laughs> we've 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 raised uh, a little bit, um, so nowhere near as many of uh, some of our fellow startups have. Um, so we still maintain a quite high percentage of our company, um, and our current trajectory is to actually not raise again, um, but actually just be live off revenue, which actually is starting to seem possible um, after almost three and a half years now. So it's pretty cool. It's <laughs> awesome. Excellent. Cool. Well, uh, Jay, maybe you can uh, wrap it up with the um, with the what's upcomings because we've only got a few minutes left. Okay. Let me just present the slides again. Um, everyone can see that. So I might just do a quick reminder before I go into what's next. Um, so we do have still quite a lot of exam vouchers for this NSA program. We want to encourage all of you to use them. Um, it, we, we can't speak about how beneficial having certifications are, right? Look, it might not get you a job, but I think it gives you the fundamental knowledge on the solutions that we have, the software that we use. Um, and for my for me personally, I've done five certifications and I think it's just it just gives you like a really good picture of the solutions that we have. So I would definitely recommend that. And of course we also have the um, student Azure credits that we offer. So you can play around with the Azure sandbox and and play around there. Shells, do you want to add anything there before I go into our next workshops? No, no. Perfect. So our next technical workshop is on Tuesday, the 23rd of August, and we also have another one on the 25th of August. These are the topics. So we have an introduction to AI, um, AI certification crash course with Prate and Kaylin. Um, and we also have a Q&A lab, so Azure Cognitive Services with Victor. And, and those will be, again, really good baseline knowledges, um, and potentially you can take some of those learnings and, and apply them into a certification. The next just, technical work. Just mention that Victor has been promoted to a gold student ambassador. So he is now the only one in the country because Kaif has uh, finished university and started working at Atlassian. So therefore we we have our <laughs> we have only one gold student ambassador. And I would encourage the rest of you to apply for student ambassadors if you are, you know, if you are a a leader in your communities and you want to help bring the bring the Microsoft community up, then join will apply because there are in fact, uh, yeah, <laughs> there, there aren't many student ambassadors left because everyone keeps graduating. So please do apply and uh, yeah. Yeah, carry on Jay. Congrats Victor. I don't know if he's on the call actually. Um, our next technical workshop is 2nd of September, so we do these once a month, uh, but we have Global AI with Rath and his team. Um, so that'll be good. That'll be in our standard time slot. Um, and if you, we'll, we might share this slide deck later, but this is a full outline of all the technical workshops we have coming up for the rest of the year. So yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks Alex for speaking. Thanks to Neil for speaking. Um, we've learned a lot. And maybe you've inspired some of us to start a startup of our own. So we'll see if there's anything coming through. If you do come join Founders Hub. <laughs> 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 Thanks.
Thanks, Jason and Deepthi. Thanks, uh, Sunil and Alex. Thanks, everyone, for joining. 